Our next speaker, my Antipodean colleague and dear friend, Ben Shuri, has put a tremendous amount of effort into making his, his restaurant, Attica, a safer and more enjoyable place to work, especially over the last few, few years. In conversation with accomplished food journalist, Lisa Abend, Ben will explore what it means to realise the potential of your team and to create a workplace based on equality and fairness. Please put your hands together for Ben Shuri and Lisa Abend. They gave us little blankets here so we can have a picnic. Um, I first met Ben at the very first MAD. And ever since then, we run into each other at different events around the world. And he's always one of those people that I seek out because he, time and again, including in that very first conversation, he has proven himself to be someone who thinks about the big questions and not only thinks about them, but acts. He's somebody I've seen, whether it's about talking about uh, overfishing or indigenous rights or his own kitchen culture, translating his deeply felt ethics again and again into action. So we're going to have a conversation today. We thought this time we would invite some other people to sit in on it. Um, do you want to start off with the, the title here? Yeah, so um, No More Cock Rock um, was the title. Here it is, No <laughs> Cock Rock. Um, do you know what Cock Rock is? I so, really have no idea. Why don't you enlighten me? Well, it's, it's generally when um, a few angry white men get together to uh, complain about their lives um, through music. And it always proposes the, the question to me, what have they got to complain about? <laughs> Not a hell of a lot. Right? Okay, well... You, I did see you complain not very long ago. I saw some real anger um, with an Instagram post that you posted not that long ago. Is that it up here? Um, can you what can you make that for you? Firstly, that's the first time I've ever sworn on social media. Um, and it's, um, it, it came about because I had got a message, a direct message from... Uh, from a young man, a very misguided young man, um, denigrating woman um, in relation to a photo of a friend's dish that I'd posted on my timeline. And I've never got a message like this before. And I was shocked by it, like really shocked. And I know to the woman in the room, it's nothing shocking to you. But for me, to be confronted with this, to be confronted with the fact that this young man clearly thought that that was something that would impress me, um, really questioned everything. You know, I questioned my own leadership and my community. Had I been doing enough publicly? All the things that we'd been working towards at the restaurant, clearly, like, this young guy had never heard of them, because if he had of and he'd listened, he never would have sent this horrible message to me. And I sat on it for probably a week, maybe five days, and every day, all the time, I thought about it, and I thought about what it meant, and I thought about shaming him, about reposting it, and um, put, putting it out there. But I, I ultimately come to realise, as the message says, that it, it was a much bigger issue, and um, I didn't feel like just addressing the individual really... Um, proved anything and it removed maybe my responsibility even. Um, and um, so I posted that and that was, um, it was somewhat difficult to write and I, I read it to uh, everybody in my team and, uh, and to be honest I was so deeply ashamed by what he had said that I broke down. And it's just unacceptable on the deepest level to me, it's profoundly unacceptable. And I just wanted to express that. Um, and this is the only way I knew how. Um, yeah. Well, it's... <laughs> 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 
one of the things that struck me about it when I saw it is I think, you know, I, I, I could see you um, feeling like you had to give voice to what is acceptable and unacceptable male behavior. But I also thought, in some ways, you were almost channeling an experience that is very common to women in the sense that you didn't see this coming. You didn't ask for it. It just popped up, right? And I think that's an experience that's so common to women, whether you are a chef or a journalist, you publish something, and somebody decides to write in the comments section something that is is derogatory or sexualizing, or if you're a cook in a kitchen, um, I think you know. The, w there's a lot of discussion about jokes in the kitchen and what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And I think one of the things that might be hard to understand about why that can be problematic is that if you're a woman and you're in the kitchen working as hard as you can, like everybody else and then somebody makes a dick joke or some other sexualized comment, it immediately reminds you that you're not actually equal. And I sort of saw you channeling that in some ways with this comment as well. Yeah, and it, absolutely, it's, it, it's very, very hard for a man to understand what it's like to be a woman, you know? It's just, it's impossible for a man to understand what it's like to be a woman, especially a white man. It's, un it's impossible for us to understand that because we will never experience the gender inequality. We were never... We were born in the beginning with such privilege and such benefits. And my... As I, we were arriving this morning on the boat, uh, my 13-year-old son, Kobe, texted me about the terrible massacre that happened overnight in America. And I felt compelled to ring him about it. So we had that discussion and then he said, what are you doing today? And I said, I'm, I'm speaking at this symposium. And he said, what are you speaking about? And I said, oh, I'm speaking about fairness. And he said, are you speaking about the thing that you posted on Instagram too, Dad, a little bit? And I said, yes, that's a part of the conversation. And then I said, he said, what, I, I said, what do you think about you know, gender inequality? What do you think about women's rights? And he said, I think it's horrific. I think it's horrible, and then he went on to tell me all the things that bothered him about it, like women not being treated as equals, women not having equal pay. And it was, uh, it was quite a little conversation to be having with a 13-year-old, certainly. Um, you raised him well. Well, I don't know if I raised him well or not, but he, I, mean, I think he thinks independently of me, you know, and uh, I don't know, maybe that is like a glimmer of hope, um, but right now, like in this moment, we're all living, men and women together, and we have to deal with the situation now. Like, you know, he is the hope. Young men and women who are coming up, young boys and girls are the hope, but right now we have to talk about what's happening and we have to confront it somewhat, you know? And uh, hmm. I think, I think for, for men, they're very scared of that. Hmm. Well, I want to... I know that that's something that you've dealt with quite directly at Attica. And um, as Kylie mentioned, and as you yourself have mentioned, um, you have succeeded in creating a different kind of kitchen culture there. And I definitely want to talk about that in a few minutes, but I, I thought maybe we could start by you stepping back a little, because I mean, you've been, how, when did you first go into a kitchen? How old were you? Uh, the first time I was ever in a commercial kitchen was when I was 10. Okay, <laughs> um, we'll, we'll leave the child labor laws out of this part. <laughs> New Zealand. Um, right, New Zealand. Okay. <laughs> um, since you've been doing this, since you were 10 years old, um, I imagine that the equitable culture is not always a part of the kitchens that you experience. Can you tell us what it was like a bit? Um, just coming up, did you, were there women in the kitchens where you worked? Did you witness inequality or mistreatment? Yeah, uh, there were women in the kitchens growing up. I, I didn't follow a traditional path in cooking. I've not worked in the great restaurants of the world. I worked in New Zealand in a small town. 
um, and there was uh, there were women in the kitchen. Um, I didn't witness the terrible inequality that we're witnessing now, um, but maybe also like I wasn't always aware of it either. Mm -hmm. Um, did I witness inappropriate behaviour? Um, yeah, I did. Like yeah. what? Well, I worked for a head chef and uh, on the line uh, at night, um, he used to tell me about how it sounded to have sex with his wife. I was uh, 17 mm. um, and he just, he, it was a direct conversation but that he would have with me and he seemed to think that that's something that I would want to hear. Again, this is not something that I wanted to hear, um, but then I didn't have the courage of my convictions to speak up about it. Mm. I wish I had had the strength to speak up about it, and you can make all of the excuses under the world why, as a man, you wouldn't speak up about it, but it doesn't matter. I didn't. Mm. And how do you see that? I mean, if I asked you what were the kitchens like in terms of bullying or verbal abuse, did you witness that? And do you see any relationship between those things? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I think, um, you know, I had, a, I had a, a job for a year in Wellington in New Zealand, which was incredibly uh, volatile environment. Um, a, a kitchen where, um, because, you know, if you shined, you would likely get punished if you shine a little bright. You know, if you tried too hard to make the cooking better, um, somebody um, older and bigger than you um, would want to physically harm you. Um, and I uh, remember um, being chased in that kitchen and being uh, close to being beaten. And uh, a friend um, who was the head chef, was one of two head chefs, saved me. And I remember um, the same person that uh, wanted to beat me because I made a duck sauce properly um, was the same person that um, would have beaten a young woman in that kitchen had it not have been for the same head chef um, who saved her as well. And um, sadly, that, that head chef is no longer with us. Um, he passed last year, he took his own life. <laughs> and he was such a good guy, you know, he was a good person in a negative time. Yeah. You know, he was somebody who, you know, like who shepherded us and he shielded us from this horrible environment that I endured for a year and a half, who we all endured, where drug taking was super common. In fact, it was incredibly uncommon to not, and I was the only one, one of the only people who didn't. And the hours, of course, were just uh, horrific, as we all know, but even more, a little bit more horrific than normal, it was seven till midnight and no breaks. And then you had to deal with this constant fear of like trying too hard or shining and otherwise you might, you know, that might be very confronting for somebody and they want to beat you for it, you know? Okay, so I think, I mean, you've, you've just mentioned a lot of different negative aspects of a culture that a lot of people here come up through and come to think of as normal, right? I mean, I think a lot of the ways in which these practices are perpetuated is that it's almost like they're passed on from generation to generation because it's what you learn because you are so young when you start and it's what you know. But you made an active decision to change it. So can you talk us through that? I mean, you, you came on board at Attica as head chef in 2005, is that right? Yeah, yeah. What was it, was it where you wanted it then? How did it start I mean, for you? then like I, you know, I wasn't such a good guy then. You know, that first year, like, I was very insecure. I was a 27-year-old head chef who had no idea about uh, how to behave, really. I mean, uh, I mean, I couldn't meet my own expectation. I couldn't meet my own goals. And it was just two of us in the kitchen then. It was myself and my best friend. And I recall bollocking him for overcooking the fish. You know, it was me that was overcooking the fish, not him. Like, I hadn't taught him properly, and I, like, bollocked him for it. And that was a reflection on me, not him. You know, but he had to cop it. And he's such a good friend that we were able to get past that. 
and we're still best friends to this day, but I live with the guilt of yelling at him like that. That's something that I think about every week almost, you know, like that, here's this person so dear to me and this is how I treated you because I was shit basically. Like I couldn't reach my ambition, I wasn't skilled enough as a head chef or as a person to be able to reach what I wanted to reach through cooking. So I took it out on him. And how did things start to change? Well, yeah. I mean, I think he left after a year, so he was like, you know what, dude, like, you know, you're my best friend, but like, you need, you need to like, I, I, yeah, you need to be better than that, yeah. you know? <laughs> and, um, and so I guess I started to learn that uh, pretty early on that that performance was based to the way you feel, the way the team feels, how happy the team is. If you're unhappy in cooking, it's very, very hard to reach your potential. Um, if you're angry, you're losing control. And you're losing control, you're not doing anything that's quality. So in service in the moment when something goes wrong and the automatic response historically has been to rage, you're just losing control of everything. Nothing is improving in that moment. Nothing is, is getting better or fixing the problem for the customer. So you need to create an environment where um, instead of fear, you need a, an environment of honesty. Because the other thing is if you have a system of fear in the kitchen, as soon as that person makes a mistake, they'll hide it. And then that, that mistake might reach the guest and if you have a system where people aren't scared of you, a system of fairness, a system of honesty that's based on trust, you, you implore them to come to you immediately with the mistake and then you fix it together as quickly as you can to salvage the best out of the situation. If you're losing control, if you're not in control of your tension, then that won't happen. And the, the quality will be much worse. And that was what I found early on. Like, uh, it's so interesting you say that though because I've heard Literally, chefs say, I want my cooks to fear me because if they don't fear me, the food won't be perfect. It's such garbage. <laughs> <laughs> if they don't fear you, your food will be better. Like, isn't that what you want? Like, don't you want to be in an environment that you feel good about going to every day? Like, you look everybody in the eye and like genuinely feel something for them? You know, compassion or love or energy, and you're gonna work towards something that's awesome, but not at the sake of smashing people? So how did you, I know a big turning point with Attica came three years ago when you bought it. Can you tell us, like at that moment where you're sort of starting your business again in some ways, not from the ground up, but you have your, a, an opportunity to make it e exactly what you want. Sure. How did you approach that, this question of no um, fear? Well, I think it, for me it, it came from going through 10 years of madness um, with uh, just ownership that just wasn't good. You know, I was the chef and I could never do what I really wanted to with the business. So when I had the opportunity to buy it, which was a lifelong dream that I never thought I would realize, and it is, it is possible, I own it by myself. And, but I wanted, I wanted to look at it differently. I wanted to look at it as to be, try to be like the best small business in Australia, not the best restaurant, but actually like the best small business and try to take kind of the fact that it's a hospitality business out of it because we're never taught anything positive in business as, as hospitality workers, really. Like, we always taught the wrong things. People are doing too many hours. People are losing their cool. I mean, the, the, the behavior in restaurants is just, is just crazy compared to the behavior. It doesn't mirror our society, you know? We're off in the Wild West a little bit. So my, my, my idea and my wish was to create the best, most ethical small business that I could. Um, you told me that you you thought that that had to be incorporated into the, the very business plan from the start. How yeah. did that work for you? Yeah, I think, I think you know, I, I wanted to set a moral agenda from the beginning um, because, because I have a conscience, some would say it's strong, and 
I can't leave the restaurant at the end of the night and sleep if, if it's been bad. You know, if the culture is bad and toxic and people are doing things to each other which aren't cool, I personally, I can't live with that. So it's somewhat of a selfish thing first, you know, like how do I feel about it? How, do, how, does, how does everybody else feel about it? You know, so that was, as the business owner, that was kind of the agenda. Um, and that's a process, you know, that's not like magically you wave a wand and everything's spot on, you know, like, uh, but it's something that we work at every day. You know, there's never a day where we don't try to be better in that regard. And it kind of comes back to the question of like, what's the point of being kind of the, the best at anything, like the best at cooking, the best restaurant in the world, if it's not fair? If it sucks for everyone that works there, including me, like, there's just no point to that. You know, everything, every accolade is completely meaningless if it doesn't feel good, you know, if, it, if it's not right, you know, and uh, so those were the questions, you know, that we ask ourselves. And did you, I mean, were you able to come up with uh, concrete measures or, or tools that would help ensure that you had, both on the, on the equality s section, but also on the uh, people feeling good section? How did you, like, create that? So, a, a couple of things. I think um, the way we hire people is a bit different. We hire people based on attitude uh, and heart, not generally on skills. It's very difficult to teach somebody to be a good person. It's easy to teach them how to make a sauce. So that's a big, that's a big thing. Yeah. I don't care if you worked in the great restaurants of Europe. In fact, you know, maybe it's even going to go against you if you come to Attica. I want somebody who really believes, somebody who's kind, and I want to be able to see that in their eyes in the interview. I want them to have a positive attitude, and I want to know that they're going to treat other people with respect. Those are the main things that I care about. I've got to work with them every day. I've got to feel good about being alongside them. Everybody else does too. We're a team of 40, and it's really critical to the culture of the restaurant that that is the way it is. Um, another thing that we did was um, about six years ago, I felt this, and we all feel this on some level, I believe, in restaurants, but there's often a disconnection between the front of house and the kitchen. It's two quite separate jobs, in fact, um, within one business, you know, and it's important to understand the roles of both those, those jobs, and they're both of equal importance. But I always felt like there was a disconnect in our team, so I came up with this idea called Staff Speeches. Mm. And uh, twice a week we gather around in the dining room, everybody who's rostered on that day, and we, we sit in a, semi uh, in a circle. There's a roster, and each, each uh, day that we have this, there's uh, somebody assigned to um, have a speech, to do a speech. And they have to prepare that speech. It's a great honor to be able to stand in front of your peers and give this speech. And so um, they, the only real rule is that it, kind of, it has to be positive. And in regards to being positive, I mean that it can't be kind of just a, a session of complaining about, you know, work. Like it has to be kind of something constructive. It can be something hard in your life. And we've heard, um, you know, conversations about um, suicide, um, mental health issues, uh, you know, a, a young woman whose family fled uh, North Korea to South Korea. We've had so many heavy, heavy conversations in the last six years, like the heaviest. And sometimes they leave you feeling deflated. Like, oh, and now it's four o'clock and we've got to get ready for service, you know? <laughs> and, but, but my idea was that I hated feeling like I was a number in a business, you know, and prior to owning my own place, I, I often did feel like I was a number, like, oh, it didn't matter because I was a quiet person. And it really, it really felt like it stripped my identity a little bit, you know, like, I, like I, nobody likes to feel like they don't count, you know, and it wasn't about like, hey, hey, look at me, it was just like, I, I can contribute too. And I really wanted to avoid that in our workplace. So I wanted to give every single person that works there the opportunity to, to stand up and say something about themselves for 15 to 20 minutes. And by doing that, the idea was that the person that's right out the back in the, you know, the pot wash 
and the person that's right out the front, maybe doing the glasses in the dining room, those two people, maybe they only cross paths once a day. Now, they don't know anything about each other. They ever have a conversation because there's no opportunity to. They're really in separate worlds. You know? And when there's conflict between those two people, it's mostly because they don't know each other. You know, they can't understand the, that person's perspective or point of view. So by giving them a voice to be able to express themselves in a positive way or even a hard story, that's the way it is, you get to know them a little bit. Now, you, you can't possibly feel empathy for somebody that you don't know, like in a restaurant, especially when the shit's hitting the fan. You know, so what has happened is that through this, through people getting to know each other a little bit more intimately in the workplace, that when something does go wrong, people just pull back a little bit. They don't jump down their throat aggressively because they know that, you know, maybe this person is bipolar and they've talked about it. Maybe they were abused so badly by the chefs that they work with in France that they're very scared, especially around men. It's important that they know that so that they can treat each one of us as individuals, not just as a hospitality worker. We're all human beings, and that, that was the idea. Well, I mean, it seems to me like it was, it was an important insight that, that treating people with respect depends first on empathy, right? And, and seeing, them as, seeing them as people, right? What about at the logistical level? I mean, do you find yourself hiring for gender balance, for example? Sure. Yeah, yeah. We, want a, we want a very... I mean, the, the business operates best when it's a, as even a split of men and women as possible. It's just a fact. You know, it's, um, when there's too many men in the kitchen, I don't like it. I don't like the feeling, you know? Um, right now, there's a... And it's not always like this, but right now, there's a 50-50 split. Exactly. I paid the wages this morning, so... That's how I know that. <laughs> um, which is, a, it's, which feels good, you know, like it just feels good. And it's, uh, you know, we never employ people based on their gender. Like, but we would always want to have a good balance. We want to employ people on their merits. Mm. I don't think by employing people on their gender alone is helping anybody at all. So for me, you know, that's what it is, you know? Yeah. Well. I want to I want to go back to to Kylie's point about leadership because it's one thing to feel these things in in yourself and to try and behave ethically for yourself but you're managing a whole team and you can't you can't necessarily guarantee that at any moment they're going to behave everybody on that team have there been challenges for you or times when you have had to confront people working for you that were not living up to your values. And how did you deal with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a management team which is uh, two women and two men. Um, and early into my ownership, um, our operations manager, Kylie, who's here today, um, came to me with a problem. <coughs> Sorry, this is a little upsetting because it's a feeling of failure when something like this happens in your workplace. You know, like, I've, I'm like a, I try to be a role model to them. And like, when somebody is like, wormed their way in who's not right, like who's got the wrong shit going on in their mind, you feel like you failed. And... You take it personally. Oh, so personally. Yeah. So personally. And somebody like this was in our team. And I wasn't aware of his characteristics, and he physically, you know, I don't even know how to say it, like, he, he manhandled um, men and women, particularly men, he threatened female members of our staff, he intimidated our manager, and this happened when I was on holiday, and I came back and learned of this on the first day that I was back. And to cut a long story short, that was the last day that he ever had at Attica. There's just no other thing to do, despite the risk, despite that that shit could come back to me. Why was it risky? Well, because 
it's risky from, even from a labor perspective, you know, like to just say, man, like, you gotta go. Like, this behavior is outrageous. Like, this goes against our culture. You have hurt people. You have hurt me. You gotta go. Like, I can't tolerate you, and I don't care about the risk to, to my business or to the company. You have to go now. And that was what happened, and, and we needed that position filled. Like, we're a small team, and we didn't have anybody to do that. So that led to Kylie, who works nine to five, pitching in, it led to me being on the floor in the dining room for six months. And we were so scared that we were going to lose a hat or a star. We think we came pretty close, eh? Because of what he did and because of the decision that I made. But you know what? Like, if you didn't draw a line in the sand at some point and say people are more important than a star or a hat, then what, what are you doing it for? Like, how could I look in the eye of anybody else who had been affected by this person and say to them, oh yeah, guys, you know, it's gonna be great today, let's go, you know? But dude, you, you let this person do this to me. You know, like, what do you stand for? You're saying one thing and you're behaving another way. So what do you say to the, your colleague, somebody who is a head chef at, or has his own restaurant, and discovers this kind of behavior, but is worried that, as I've heard from people that I've interviewed, uh, when they've reported something like harassment, told, yeah, I know, but he's a really good chef, mm. and then I'd have to fire him. When you hear that kind of thing um, in the industry as a whole, how do you respond to your colleagues? Oh, I mean, it's, it's really black and white to me. You know, like, I'm sorry, I know it's, it could be difficult, I suppose, like it has, it just has to happen. You have to make a strong decision. You have to look at the facts. And if somebody, it's super dangerous to allow somebody like that to stay in your workplace. You know, like, wh like what the hell, it's not even a question for me. You know, like, it, there's no question there. You know, it, that person has to go. That person's rotten. You know, you can't fix that. If it's bad enough, it, you can't fix it. And, uh, and it will rot everything else. You know, and I've, I've also been there as well. Hmm. Well, one of the, I think one of the challenges is creating an environment, not just, I mean, as you said with, the, with your staff speeches, where people feel understood, but where they trust that if something does go wrong or where they're not being treated fairly, that they, there's venues and they trust that it will be dealt with, right? And that and it w there will be some kind of response because oftentimes there isn't. How have you handled that? Have you discovered any ways to make people in your employ feel comfortable with coming forward with, with that sort of thing? Yeah, that is something that is on my mind a lot, especially um Especially if you're, I'm, an, I'm a man and I own the restaurant, uh, particularly if you're a woman, I'd like to think that, that any woman in my restaurant could come to me with any problem without fear. But I also know that that's not the way it is in society either. And so that's why it's important to have women as senior managers in any restaurant as well and empower them and allow them to make decisions. And that's what happens at Attica, you know, we have Kylie an operations manager capacity and she helps set the moral agenda along with me. That's been hugely influential on me as a man. But even beyond that, I, I've been thinking lately, and I've, this is only really an idea, but what would happen in a restaurant if something happened? And what would happen if, for hypothetically, if a young woman or a woman of any age had been sexually harassed by a man in your venue and was scared to come forward because that person had been working there a long time and it was known that we had a very close relationship, which is the truth in every restaurant, including mine. What if they thought, well, this happened to me, but I see Ben talking and laughing with this man every day. 
he won't believe me, he won't do anything about it, and I'm not going to say anything because I'm scared to say anything. What if, what would happen then? So there's this idea that I had about there being another person that's not connected to the restaurant, which is a person that you could go to, uh, somebody respected in the community, like, an om- like kind of like a restaurant ombudsman, so that you could go to outside of the restaurant and you could talk to them about the problem and that person would hold the restaurant accountable if the right action wasn't taken. That's such an amazing idea. I mean, it's, it's, it's really innovative and I think one of the things that has struck me as an observer of this industry, especially among restaurants and chefs at your level, is that you're all so innovative when it comes to food and yet in many cases, in most cases, you've inherited a brigade system that dates back to the Franco-Prussian War, literally, and nobody's ever changed it, and no one ever thinks to innovate that. And it sounds like maybe, I assume you still have a brigade, do you? A brigade? I mean, do you consider it a brigade? We don't have brigades in Australia, right? Eh? <laughs> no. We just have people that work in kitchens. Um, I mean, there's some level of hierarchy, but mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. It's pretty even. But you're, t- you're trying to sort of affect the structure of the kitchen. Yeah. I mean, everybody is as important as anybody else. All humans are of the same value. It's, not, it's just, you know, we place these kind of measures on, on kitchens and we say some people are more, more, more important than others because that's how we control and discipline things. But t- for me, like, if you do that too much, what you do is you have a bunch of junior staff who can't think for themselves, who won't call out things when they see them who are wrong, won't fix mistakes, so I try to make sure that everybody feels like they have proper ownership. It's not just a, like a, a thing that I'm saying, it's actually something that I believe in. You know, that if, if you actually have, you know, if you're actually invested because you believe that it's a good place uh, and, and you are told, hey, you can affect a positive outcome in the service tonight just as much as any other person, be the person that picks up the piece of rubbish on the floor and doesn't want to get recognition for it, just do it as your very being, you know, so that's kind of what I try to promote, you know, that, and again, it comes back not feeling like a number, you mm. know. And, I mean, we, we don't have time, I don't think, to go into m- much of this too, but I know that you've also taken on questions about hours and how many, what mm. kinds of, um, yeah, what kinds of hours you're asking for people, which has an impact just on everybody's general quality of life and whether they actually have a life, but it can also impact whether, the, you know, whether women feel like they can stay in the industry as well. And if you look at something like that and you look at what you're saying about trying to diminish the, the nefarious effects of hierarchy, I want to go back to that question about, you know, that I brought up in the context of fear. Has it affected quality? Do you feel like you're a less lesser restaurant at the level of cuisine because of it? No, I think, um, I mean, we've, we are working at most 48 hours in the kitchen um, or less, in the front of the house at most 45 hours or less. Um, that's across four days in the kitchen, so they have, the staff have three days off. Um, I mean... the quality is better than ever. Like, there's just no comparison, you know? What I'm asking for, I'm not talking about being all lovey-dovey and being soft, as some people have have accused me of. You know, it's not what it is. It's like, I need 48 hours, I need an elite 48 hours from you. You know, I need you to be great for 48 hours, then I need you to go and forget about this and have a great life and concentrate on some stuff that's good for you. Have breakfast with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your wife or, you know, like whatever, like I don't care, please, just don't, don't be here. (laughs) Um, And at the start of this, we literally had to police it, like I'm there first, same time as Kylie, we see in the camera, staff coming like two hours before their shift, literally we had to go out there and say go away, (laughs) like you can't be here, you know, like your shift is not starting, so please go away, have a coffee, I don't care. Um, And so it it was a really big cultural shift for them as well because they never ever worked like this. You know, they 
they always sort of, everybody subscribes into this, you've got to do the hours, you know, you just got to do the hours, otherwise you're not hardcore, you know, which is such nonsense. What about if you did less hours and you did them a lot better, you know? I think there's something in that, and there definitely is something in that, Attica, that's, that's how it is, and, and the food is better than it was, um, and the, but the culture, particularly, the, the environment, the atmosphere is like, the best of all time, you know? And it's not to say that, I'm not sitting here saying we're perfect and that's, we, you know, we live in a bubble that we don't affected by everything the same as you guys affected, but, 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 it, but the culture is excellent, you know? And, uh, and people are like genuinely happy and they can do things. They can get a haircut, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, my last question for you. Yesterday, um, during the Q&A session, there was a man seated over here who asked about male, mole, uh, male role models and where, like, how do you encourage men to step into that role for other men? Um, you seem like somebody who might be, have some insights into how to do that. Do you, any uh, tricks? Uh, how do you be a male role model? Um, I mean, I think it's like, uh, it's a daily battle, you know, to be honest. Mm. Like I think uh, I, had this, I had this awesome conversation with a dear friend last night about how it was to recover from alcohol and drug addiction. Um, and he was telling me how it was an everyday thing. It was a choice every single day to not take drugs. Every single day, every moment of his life, he's deciding not to take drugs and not to take alcohol. And I would liken it to that somewhat. Mm. Every single day, many, many, many times a day, you have to think about equality in your workplace if you're a man. You just have to. It has to be on your mind as a constant thing. You have to hold yourself accountable. In my opinion too, forever and a day, actions will speak louder than words. Okay, I think we should end it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.